Welcome back for another episode of Christian Conspiracy Coalition, a place where the best minds in the conspiracy realm gather to share and discuss their faith, Christianity, and the spiritual war thrust upon humanity. Napoleon is quoted as saying, history is the version of a past events that people have decided to agree upon. This combined with terms such as history is written by the victor, it's easy to see why one of the most hotly debated topics is historical existence of Christ. This is a topic theologians, historians, and scholars have argued over for hundreds of years now. To help me cover this theological, historical, and secular perspective, I'm joined by Brandon Kroll of the Manor Daily Podcast. Thanks for having me back on, Drew. No worries, mate. I need to have you on for this one. I need some heavy hitters on this. This is a big topic that uh, needs all the guns blazing, that's for sure. And next up, Luca from the Justified Belief Podcast. Welcome, Luca. Oh, thank you, Drew. I love coming on here. I appreciate all the invites. It's good having you back, mate. We've missed you recently, and you, just like Brandon, you do your due diligence and really digging deep and finding the data sets, the information, and the correlating points to back up your position. And that's what I think is very rarely missed in Christianity. Far too often, people just rely solely on the Bible, and they don't use those extra biblical tests, uh, texts, historical, secular, non-secular. We can use all of these to form our, our views and our beliefs, and I don't think we're using those enough in this day and age. Mm, agreed. So uh, this little topic of conversation stemmed from a, a presentation done by a rather big content creator in the conspiracy field named Archaics titled The Jesus Myth Exposed Collapsing a Modern Fairy Tale. Now, the basis of which he draws on data sets and formulates his belief utilizing aspects of altered history, forged documents within the church, while sim simultaneously using church documents that dismiss the existence of God. From my own point of view, listening to his presentation twice, which goes for two hours, by the way, is that it seemed to he held two views at the same time. One, that all history is fake and fabricated. And two, that all his data sets and evidence that support his position are historically accurate. So already he's going through the mental gymnastics of my data sets are correct, but these ones are false. It seems like a picking and choosing approach. And this approach takes into the account that absence of evidence is absence of truth. Using aspects such as these being non -mint, no minted coins at the time of Christ, no Christ depicted on Roman era coins. There were no busts or artwork for the first 400 years following Christ's death. Which leads me to this statement. He has this very skewed idea of history. The reality is we don't have much archaeological evidence, or virtually none, of anyone who lived in Jesus' time and place. The lack of evidence does not mean a person in the time didn't exist. It means that he or she, like 99.99% .99 of the rest of the world at the time, made no impact on the archaeological record. He did impact the spiritual and religious record. Because we don't have physical aspects of, say, Christ, the busts, the, the statues, the minted coins, all these things, a lot of these historians seem to put their heel on, doesn't mean the person didn't exist. We've got the oral language stories. We've got written accounts. We've got historians, both Roman, pagan, um, Syrian, Syrian, all the people within the generalized region and where Christ lived and died have accounts of this. A lot of people who were fundamentally against the early church, might I add. So what does this whole conversation mean? We've, I think this conversation really started off when the atheists really kicked up the idea that all religions are fairy tales and myths. And then that kind of trans, transferred into the, the new age kind of aspect where it's source and spirituality and they're really trying to remove the idea of God and make it all about you and you're the individual. So why, why are we coming back to this conversation now that... Christ wasn't real, that Jesus has no historical reference. Well, who would like to start? I would love to. Go for it. I mean. So I think, honestly, they're laying the foundation. Like like it says, I think uh, it's Matthew 24, 11, and many false prophets will arise and mislead many. And I see that with folks like Billy Carson's. I see that with folks like Archaics. And what are they doing? They're planting the idea of doubt. They're planting the idea of either like agnostic, atheist, or question everything. So if there is doubt, 
at the end in the wake of World War III, like Albert Pike was predicting in 1871, the Third World War was supposed to abolish the uh, and annihilate the atheists, the agnostics, and, and um, the nihilists. And the chief target was to be Christianity. Now, I don't think you can kill Christianity specifically, but, you know, yes, you can kill with sword. But what I'm more stating is, like, I, if you can kill not necessarily the individual, but you can kill the legend. You've demoralized the main thing of what Christianity is, which is the word. So when the word was made flesh, you have to understand that with Christ, that's where I'm coming from. If you destroy that, you've demoralized the power of what the word is. And when you get to Revelation 18.23, it says, The voice of the groom and the bridemaid was heard no longer in thee. Why? Because our power as Christians is understanding the word, giving clarity and context to what it is. We are actually living it. We are living sermons. And suddenly, let's say they create their own Armageddon. Christ doesn't show up. There was no rapture. And suddenly you're just sitting there in this state of, is everything I ever believed in a lie? And then you have this Anunnaki return of the ancient gods, Sumerian text, Emerald tablets. Oh, the new agers were right. And all these people who've been kind of like flitting around, not really doing anything, waiting for an rapture extraction, they're going to be susceptible to people that are putting this false content out there for the last couple of years because they had nowhere else to go and they had no real basis of understanding the word and discernment with it. That's that's my personal takeaway. You hit a really good point in regards to, say, destroying the belief more than killing the people via the sword because that's what we saw in the early foundations of the church when yeah. all these denominations of Christians and the early church was popping up and it was across the whole Roman Empire, the pagan Romans thought to themselves, we can kill nation states, we can kill people, but we cannot kill an idea. How do we kill yes. an idea? We control it. They made it the one religion of the Roman Empire, which makes yeah. sense. So in a lot of ways, they're just rehashing the old playbook. Instead of controlling the idea, they're now trying to destroy the idea through the many mechanisms you've just mentioned. It's like usurping yeah. the idea, taking away the faith, getting those fence sitters, the people who have doubt sowed in their hearts, are going to look at a massive event, a, made, a massive stage black swan event as this is the end times and Christ didn't return. Yeah, they were right. I was wrong right. all along. I've been lied to. What do you right. think, Luca? I think uh, some people just come out with this the grand claim of like oh jesus didn't exist and uh look at this and this is why uh, just kind of for um kind of for internet fame honestly because you know it's, if you really look at it just uh the totality of everything i mean that's a pretty bold claim to make even at face value because you how do you then explain away why christ shows up in all these different religions you know i mean what kind of like that's you, you would have to argue that there's some type of grand cultural conspiracy across multiple cultures, across multiple uh, uh, um, histories of people across different continents. Like, that's just, that's insane. Like, it, like to just come out and blatantly say that it's made up or that it, uh, Christ was not a historical figure is, there's really no basis for it, you know? And if you, if you look at it, I mean, it, let's say like the biggest thing I like to point to is a crucifixion. Well, you know, the entirety of Christian Dom would collapse if somebody could prove that the crucifixion wasn't a historical event, but the, but it was a historical event, you know, and it is well documented in terms of, you know, antiquity documentation. You know, there's more things talking about Christ as a historical reference within that first to second century period than things talking about, for instance, like Alexander the Great. I think there's like, I think there's like a frag fragment of a document. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's a fragment of a single document that talks about Alexander the Great as a historical figure, and nobody questions it, you know. And then you have writings from like Pliny the Younger, Josephus, uh, the writings from inside the Talmud that vehemently attacked Christ. Um, you have uh, Lucinia Samosota. Um, he was like a uh, he was a play writer who didn't like Christianity and mock Christians in the play Cornelius Tacitus. I, I mean, there's, there's a bunch. So to just blatantly say that it was fake, I mean, you, how are you going to explain all of that away from different people, different cultures? And then, then once more, you know, what, what is even the motivation to make all that up? 
you know, it's easy to place a pin right in the Roman church and say, oh, you know, this happened because of Cornelius and the gang and it's, it's all, it's all an inside job. But what about all the historical writings from, you know, four or 500 years pre the formation of the Roman Catholic church? Uh, you know, you would have to just ignore it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And if you just ignore it and okay, like you're not really, you don't really care about what is the truth. You just care about what is your truth and yes. promoting what you, yeah, about what it. your truth is. You know what I mean? I th so I think that fundamentally he draws on a lot of great ideas in regards to the church has um, faked mm -hmm. a lot of documents. The church has done a lot of wrong in its time, which I don't dismiss by any account. The Roman Catholic church has a lot to answer for, especially in the early founding of the church, even up into the present day. The problem is you conflate that with, you can't trust the Holy Roman Church's historical accounts, but I, I can trust the scholars of the ancient past. Well, who does he think kept these scholarly works alive? It was the Roman Catholics which sacked the Alexandrias. They took all these ancient writings mm -hmm. and these ancient texts. They kept them alive. So you're in a dialectic of, I can't trust the Roman Catholic Church and their historical account, but I can trust the things that they kept alive. Like you mentioned, Luca, they're historical figures that have very little evidence of actually existing beyond Christ. Mm -hmm. Socrates, Plato, all of these are documents that are far older than Christianity, but somehow we just believe them because they're older or because mm -hmm. they're considered secular and not connected to any kind of Catholic or Christian doctrine. It's this weird dialectic of I can trust this, but I, I can't trust this. And that tells me it's more someone who has a, a raging hard on against the Catholic Church more than they have against the actual historical doc documentation. Mm -hmm. I myself am no fan of the Catholic Church, but at the same time, I can separate the historical accounts, what the church did, and the scholars of the time who were recording about Christ or a, a king of the Jews at mm -hmm. the time that aren't documented inside the Catholic church. There's other data points or other sets of data that correlate to this being the same person. I think the best thing, man, is really just, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just going to tap onto what you said, Luca, because that is the definition of sophistry where we get a root word for sophisticated. It was parlor tricks of like, okay, give me something, point to something for me. And they'd be like, all right, here's a tree. Well, the tree means this and da 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 da. And you create this whole fun little narrative and it's entertainment. Is it true? No, but it's your truth. And I made it entertainment. I made it palatable for the court and the king to hear. And that's honestly what they do with our news is like the Republicans are hearing their version of what they want to hear of events. So it's like a propaganda. And then they do the same thing with how we hear it from our, our, our denominational perspective. But ever so subtly, they're weaving us back to the, the whore of Babylon, Catholicism. But, the, but how are they doing that? They're making us doubt like or, or culminate all of Christianity to be associated with one particular denomination. Like a lot of people in the East will be like, well, look at your Catholic church. I'm like, I have nothing to do with that institution. I'm not denominationally <laughs> for, for a reason. Um, but ultimately, I think my biggest pull away is that the idea is to distort the image. So like, you know, give, give Christ a halo. We don't need an image because that's not necessary. Delude his word. So that's confusing and you get stuff like the Mandela effect, like Kerwin's brought up and then to destroy his people's faith, which if you can't be God, then weaponize his own people. And if you don't understand the word, you can't read the Latin text. You're going to go on a crusade. You're going to do the things that they want you to do, or you're going to buy these false teachers that they prop up because they love false teachers. Because what does that do? You can utilize them as pawns because if you don't have a purpose. You become a pawn in their game and they can use you as they so choose. I'm reading this book, um, Rulers of Evil. Phenomenal. No wonder it's 200 bucks. But it was explaining how even Sun Tzu, did he really exist? And they're highly suspecting, this guy breaks it down, and I'm, I'm convinced now, that Sun Tzu was actually a Jesuit. And one of the chief things in there nice. was to dictate the minds of what the enemy army is thinking. So I think there's an element of that in play when you mention that. The thing, too, with the... Uh kind of just backtracking slightly with the whole coins and like why Rome doesn't acknowledge Christ. The Roman empire up till, you know, making Christianity, the central religion, 
just didn't care because like imagine being like a Roman anybody, any big wig in Rome, and you hear little rumors and whispers of some guy out in distant lands of your territory that you don't even care about really. You know, oh yeah, he uh, raised the guy from the dead. We're getting reports of this guy healing, healing, uh, you know, healing the blind and healing the sick. Okay, is he is he a threat to Rome? Is he affecting us in any way? No. All right, who cares? <laughs> Life carries on. But you know, when they did care was when it started affecting them financially because there was a t point in history when that uh, Christianity was turning a corner in Rome, and like a lot of these pagan rites and rituals were starting to be. Uh, kind of uh sent by the wayside so it was actually costing temples money and that's when rome started paying attention to christianity was when all these people started converting to christianity and they weren't following the rites and rituals of the you know the pagan uh um belief systems at the time so they weren't dumping their money into these pagan cults and things of that nature and there's actually writings from um ooh, it was a roman governor at the time i'm trying to remember his name he launched he actually launched an investigation into uh into christianity to see who the christians were pliny the younger that's that's what it is it, pliny the younger and his writings where he was talking about how you know the temples the pagan temples weren't being visited by people anymore they weren't doing their sacrifices or making their tithes to the temple and that's really what caught uh, uh rome's attention was starting to focus in on Christianity. But other than that, I mean, they really didn't care. You know, all it was at the time to them was just, you know, rumors and whispers, you know, but the fact that uh, um, Cornelius Tacitus actually documented uh, the, uh, the crucifixion and where Christianity started when cru uh, Christ was crucified during the during the uh rule of uh what was the governor's name oh my gosh i'm drawing a blank pontius, pontius Pilot. Pilate. yes thank you pontius Pilate in judea so he actually historically documented that pontius Pilate was the uh prefect of the territory of judea at the time when christ was crucified that's something that for the longest time you know people thought was just a random biblical narrative but it but it's actually historically documented um by that historian cornelius tacitus so they really didn't care because to them it was all rumors and whispers, you know, for a time. Just on the coins as well, Luca, people forget to realize that Rome became the first state, like state nation, where they mm -hmm. elevated themselves even above their pagan gods. The early 4th century BC, they started to make minted coins with their pagan gods. That exists, yes. But as they transitioned into a state where it was about the Caesar or the emperor ruling over, it became about their figureheads of man. Man mm. became God in a lot of ways. They were deifying mm. themselves as their gods on coins. So is it why would a pagan faith start minting coins of the king of Jews who died for everyone since? They wouldn't do that. It just doesn't make mm -hmm. sense. It doesn't pass the pub test. If you were to tell someone in the pub this, they go, no, that wouldn't pub... make sense. So where's the common sense and logic approach to this, which uh, uh, KX bases a lot of his work on? Common sense and logic, yes, I follow that as well, but they wouldn't mint those coins. And even after the fact, when they did become Christian, they were still so arrogant in their control of being a nation state and kings and emperors, they were still putting themselves above a Christ. Heck, look at what the Pope does. The Pope, in a lot of ways, does personify himself as being a godlike entity on earth. Oh, well, he does. That, that's that, the title vicar yeah the yeah. vicar of christ that that's literally and uh, pontifus maximus was supposed to be the chief of the pagan priests and it was sol invictus mithraism was the chief thing so I, I bought another book and it was talking about for like i don't know almost 200 years prior to to constantine that they were already flirting with mithraism because they had legions that were over there then they'd come over to rome and it was it was starting to become one of those things where it's like well, what if we just merge the two? Merge the two? Yeah, sun god worship, <laughs> sun of god worship. And then I'll be the representative number one, Doug, while he's up there. And if you'll if you'll know, like you just were saying, with the coins, I am the god while he's up there. I am the representation of while he's up there. And you look up the originator of coinage, which is alleged to be Nimrod's son, Tammuz, Hermes. If that's true... Why? Because Lord means Baal. 
And they're saying they are the Lord while on earth. And then what was all the European states doing? They were lords over the people and serfs. So there's already a tier system of no, no, no. I'm still in control of everybody else. Whereas before in Christianity, it says it didn't matter if you were rich, if you were poor, everybody was coming together in a community. But when you made it a state religion and you merged it with this other stuff, it already was creating confusion because it was like, well, which one is it? It's all of them. We're just merging the two. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this is where one of the arguments comes in that for the first 400 years, outside of coins, there were no busts, there were no murals, there were no mosaics of Christ. He neglects to realize that the basis and where Christianity was founded was still controlled by the Pharisees and the Jews of the time who didn't look very favorably upon Christ. So would they have not destroyed any of these effigies that they would claim him to be? Outside mm -hmm. of that, this entire region was conquered by Islam. We know Islam in the modern day mm -hmm. has a tendency to destroy statues and, and personifications of gods they don't agree with. They only see mm -hmm. Christ as a prophet. They do not see him as the son of God. So it's not outside the realm of possibility that there could have been statues or murals or mosaics mm. throughout time that have been destroyed throughout the annals of history. This is things well, that I, naturally occur. I would I would argue the point too that I mean the Israelites wouldn't have done that anyway. Like they weren't they wouldn't make eff effigies or little carved idols of Yahweh. So why would they do it mm. for a cry? I mean, mm. yeah, obviously they hate they didn't like Christ, but even like let's just take Christ out of the picture. While other nations around the Israelites were making, you know, carved idols to like Molech, Chemosh, and all those gods, the Israelites weren't because their God was living among them. Yes. You know, and that's that's the whole thing. Like their God was physically living with them. You know, when he appeared to Moses, he appeared to the Israelites as a cloud. He would during the Exodus, he led them as a pillar of fire, pillar of smoke, day and night, right? Like he was physically there. So why would you have to carve an idol or a bust for your God if he's living amongst you? You know, it's not like the, like I said, it's not like the other tribes around them, uh, the Canaanites uh, who had, you know, I think they were worshiping Chemosh. They had uh, carved idols. The Bible talks about the carved idols. The Asherim, you know, they were carving idols for the Asherim. For Molech, they were making the molten images. I mean, you know, even, heck, even the Israelites with the, uh, with the golden calf, they made the calf. But if the calf was real and living amongst them, they probably they wouldn't need to. I mean, that's why they never, in my opinion, that's why they never made effigies or uh, carved idols for Yahweh. So why would you do it for Christ? He he's real. He's the one true living God. Lives among his people. Good point. Good well, point. Good. And it's pretty hard to make a sculpt of a pillar of smoke or a pillar of fire, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> it's not some yeah, deity with an yeah. animal head and then horns and stuff associated with mm -hmm. it. It's much harder to sculpt. Of course, you know, but you also the the ark was the is the mercy seat, you know, then that's where the spirit of the Lord was uh, presiding. And, you know, there's multiple passages in the Bible talking about the glory of the Lord filling the temple or filling the tent when the when it was just a tent. I mean, you know, you don't have to carve an idol or to carve the image of God if he's already there with you. Absolutely. Why he didn't want that. Um, I did an episode. God's been divorced because when you understand the significance of the temple veil, Holy of Holies were where it was where God's word was. That's where he was kept within the temple. So it rips in half. What happens? Greater is he that is within you than he that is of the world. Know you not your body is a temple of the Lord. Now, New Agers trying to say that, oh, you just find God within. Like all these other pagan deities are just like, you know, we'll find God within. Sun God worship signed it. And, you know, whereas the other one is saying, no, I've surrendered to this. I want to accept the word. That was Christ. I want to follow that. I want to follow that promise. And a lot of people don't seem to understand this is that's the significance is that you now your body is a temple. You now are supposed to be a high priest. You're supposed to speak up. You're supposed to talk. You're supposed to give your knowledge or you get in Hosea. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And he says, I'll reject you from being my high priest. We are supposed to be speaking up and advocating what we know and what we're seeing. And I think a lot of modern Christianity, they sit back and they just shrug off people that are producing this kind of content when in actuality, we're supposed to be condemning false teachers, not saying they're just a baby in the faith, or maybe they'll get there. It's like, no, <laughs> we're we're supposed to be laying it out solid, saying, no, 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 that this is leading somebody astray, especially as a new Christian. We're supposed to be condemning that out openly, as Paul was doing frequently by name. Do not follow that individual. Do we do that now? I don't think, no, I don't think most of us do. I think we're in a good space right now, because... 
we're not attacking him personally. We're not attacking his no. character. But at the same time, in watching his video, he repeatedly said, if I trigger anyone, that's on you. He's already on the, the front foot. He's on the attack. For anyone who criticizes him, we're suddenly labeled as triggered. He's using the weaponization of words to put any kind of criticism back on him or questioning of his beliefs as being where in the wrong, which is a very interesting dialectic to take in this. I have to come back to the idea that there are secular and other historical accounts of Christ outside of the Roman church. And I'm going to read uh, one of Marabar Serapian, 70 AD, who was a Syrian philosopher uh, who's, who was writing to his son to encourage him about the compared life and persecution of Jesus um, with that of other philosophers who were persecuted for their ideas. The fact Jesus is known to be a real person with this kind of influence is important. Marabar Serapian refers to Jesus as the wise king. And this is what he wrote to his son. What benefit did the Athenians obtain by putting Socrates to death? Famine and plague came upon them as judgment for their crime. Or the people of Samos for burning Pythagoras. In one moment, their country was covered with sand. Or the Jews by murdering their wise king. After that, their kingdom was abolished. God rightly avenged these men. The wise king lived on in the teachings he enacted. This is coming from a Syrian, a person who was not Christian, a person who was pagan, an historical account of the wise king of the Jews. This is quite clearly Christ. He may not call him Jesus Christ or Yeshua or Jesus of Nazareth, but it is clearly the same person. And he's backing it up with other historical figures of the region of the world. So this is just one small account of data sets outside of the Catholic Church that back up the existence of Christ. Now, this one, I don't think he even mentioned in that video because he didn't come across it, but I found it. And we mentioned this early before the recording. There were many aspects of the video which a quick Google search could refute. And I think, you know, he, like he, I said earlier, he has a good basis in the lies and the, the subterfuge that the Catholic Church has, has perpetrated on humanity, but he's leaning on it too hard. He's letting that cloud his vision or he's doing it deliberately. Hmm which I would hope that's not the case. I hope he's led astray and he, he doesn't actually realize what he's doing, but that's the way I view it. It's a lot for people to, uh, you know, kind of, you have to want to know about this, right? Like about truth, right? You have to want to uh, study these things and study the word and look at the historicity because that's really the only way to get to the real, like, meat and potatoes of what you're reading you know because too many people put uh all their trust or their fact finding in in the catholic church and i'm not by any means i'm i'm not insulting catholicism i it may sound like it for what i'm about to say but i'm really not you know i was catholic at one point but really i when i started reading my bible and then i started studying the word more and then I, when i started looking at why some books were removed Cause that's always the big thing, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm much like, like you, uh, I I'm non-denominational. I think like putting labels for denominations is it, it's actually spoken against in the Bible. Like we're, we're, that's, we're not supposed to be doing that. We're like fracturing the body of Christ with different labels. It's okay to have different, uh, views or opinions, but we don't have to, you know, make ourselves special, you know, by saying, Oh, I'm this, I'm a Protestant, I'm a Lutheran, I'm a Orthodox Catholic, I'm this cat, you know, we're we're all for Jesus, right? At the end of the day, we're all for Christ. We believe in 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 God, Jesus. He is the manifestation of Yahweh, right? But sadly, the Catholic Church has become such a huge influence culturally for Christianity that people look to what they're doing, and they think it's Christianity. They are doing their own thing. The Catholic Church is doing its own thing, and I know that's gonna make a lot of people angry. But it's, and I don't want to get, I don't want to start dr driving down in the rabbit hole and getting off topic, but they do a lot of things that are not really biblically supported, you know, and they, they often sneer at people who believe in the whole sola scriptura thing. But, you know, my quick argument for that is, well, if you look to, let's say like the Pope as this infallible interpreter, well, what about all the times Pope's made mistake in history? Like you either have to ignore that or what the new thing now I hear the argument is like, well, well, 
when they did indulgences right back in Martin Luther's time. And then they said, Oh, ho, ho, we uh, can't do this no more. You know, and they wrote it off while the Pope wasn't speaking infallibly at that point. What? <laughs> <laughs> like he's either infallible or he's not infallible. And now the future dilemma with that is going to be when the Pope comes out. And I think he did it already. I'm pretty sure he said that uh, like all religions are the same. Or yeah, they all lead equal. to God, right? I believe one of the yeah, they're all I, I, equal. They all lead to God. Was yeah, I believe he said, and that is not that is not a biblical truth. That and and that's not even an Islamic truth. You know, even if like there are some folks who st practice Islam who get behind that, and that's not even that's expressly forbidden in the in the um, Quran. You know, just like in the Bible, like there, it's not all roads lead to the same God. That neither of those books says that. You know. Mm -hmm. But now if you if you look at the Pope as this infallible authority, you're going to start going in that direction. And that specifically goes against the word of God, 100%. Or like I'm, a buddy of mine was bringing up, I guess uh, the Pope had at some, some time recently, you know, said that people are inherently good. That's not a biblical teaching. The Bible teaches people are inherently bad. <laughs> like we're, we're inherently corrupt. You know, so you have like you have to have the word of God, man, and you have to study it and know what it says to really f dial in and get to know Christ, get to know God. Otherwise, you risk being led astray or in a, uh, and I'm sorry, what, what was that guy's name? Archa Archaics. Archaics. Thank you. And and I'm and I've never met the man. I'm just speculating here. You know, in Archaics case, and and it's all in a lot of people's cases, in my opinion. You know. The Catholic Church has propped itself up as the shining beacon of Christianity, and people look at that and think that's what it is, and and it's really it's really not. So. Does anyone have any other say historical counterpoints that would show the yeah. existence of Christ that they'd like to share? I got that thing with Josephus here. Mm -hmm. uh, some interesting things. It says about this time lived Jesus, a wise man, if 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 indeed one ought to call him a man. He was the Christ. And then it says, around this time um, lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was a worker. Um, I don't know why that's scrunching up on me. Let's see. A worker of amazing deeds and was a teacher of people who accept the truth with pleasure. And looking into just Josephus, he was part of two denominational sects, and eventually he went back to going to the Pharisees. But he's even writing that this guy had a credence, and if he was a man. So this is a guy who a lot of historians regardless of oh ethnicity bias whatever he is acknowledging within this region this guy did indeed exist to say like there's three abrahamic faiths or religions to be more precise and there's one faith there's one faith there's two religions one faith and you have father abraham that's islam uh judaism and then christianity and then you go over to christ and even islam acknowledges that at least he was a good prophet you have Christianity as the chief of, of Christianity, and even the the Jews themselves are bashing them in their texts. So you have three major religions within the world, all going back to Father Abraham, but at this crux where Old Testament, New Testament meets, everyone's acknowledging this historical figure did indeed exist. Whether they hated him, loved him, or said he was at least a good, wise man, this is an undebatable fact. To say that, oh, it's just all made up, or it's it's like, no. Because then you don't have, like, if you say you also hate the secret societies who run the world, you're then throwing out the baby with the bathwater because you're only saying the dark side, but it's like, what about the light side? You're now suddenly saying there is nothing to counteract and balance this out because Jesuits, Masons, Catholicism, whatever you call it, they all trace back to the dark side of all of this. So if we're going to say that Star Wars exists, there has to be the rebels, there needs to be the Imperial <laughs> Force. To say that there's never going to be a resistance, call, again, we could use any name, fic, 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 any fictional thing. There always has to be a counterpoint. And the fact that you're denying that it didn't exist because you're not seeing any physical evidence, well, good sir, please look at creation. Thank <laughs> that's you. All you have to do. And for the that's, that's, that's what I would say. And for the listeners, some context around that, Josephus was born four years after the crucifixion. So he was around the area, very close to the time of Christ. He wrote the book Antiquities of the Jews in 93 AD. He was a consultant for Jewish rabbis at an early age, became a Galilean military commander by the age of 16, and he was an eyewitness to much of what was recorded in the first century AD. Under the rule of Roman Emperor Vespasian, 
Josephus was allowed to write a history of the Jews. The history included three passages about Christians, one in which he described the death of John the Baptist, one in which he mentions the execution of James uh, and describes him as a brother of Jesus Christ, and a final passage which describes Jesus as a wise man and the Messiah. This is legitimate historical accounts. Like you said, Brandon, whether he yeah. agreed with him on a theological level or not, he's acknowledging the existence of this person and the broader implications of he was so close to living in the same time as Christ. It was a few years yeah. after his death he was born. That's the closest historical account we can get. Yeah. The, uh, if I may, it's it's a little lengthy, but... um. The one that I see a lot of folks who are kind of like in esoteric circles pick at is actually the Babylon, Bab uh, excuse me, Babylonian Talmud um, that talks about Christ. I've heard some folks say that it's talking about a guy named named Ben Astadia. I've actually that so that's actually not true. Um, and I recall seeing like a passage that allegedly came out of the Talmud that was talking about Ben Astadia. But it actually is not Jesus, and there's like there's a lot of interesting uh, scholarly comments on why it's not. But the point of me, the reason I bring this up is actually because there's one specific portion of the Babylonian Talmud called the Sanhedrin 43a, and there's censored versions of it. And and so let me just read the censored version to you real quick. So this is Sanhedrin 43a from the Bab Babylonian Talmud. It says. It has been taught on the eve of Passover they hanged Yeshu, and an announcer went out in front of him for 40 days saying he is going to be stoned because he practiced sorcery and enticed and led Israel astray. Anyone who knows anything in his favor, let him come and plead in his behalf. But not having found anything in his favor, they hanged him on the eve of Passover. This is actually a censored version, and the reason I say it's censored is because there is a lot of ambiguity in this passage where some folks try to say that Yeshu is not actually Yeshua Jesus, but Yeshu is like a nickname for some guy named Ben Estadia, and that this, is, this passage is not even talking about Christ. Which, fine. You want to argue that? Fine. There's some ambiguity. We could call it ambiguous, but the reason I say it's a censored version is because there's actually the real uncensored version of Sanhedrin 43a in Munich. It's called the Munich Manuscript Sanhedrin 43a, and this is the whole thing unscrubbed because what I read to you has been – that is a scrubbed version where they stripped a lot of things out and started just disseminating it. This is the real unedited version of Sanhedrin 43a. The eve of the Passover, Yeshu, the Nazarene, was hanged for 40 days before the execution took place. A herald went forth and cried, He is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf. But since nothing was brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of Passover, Ula retorted, do you suppose that he was one from whom a defense could be made? Was he not the Messiah, or excuse me, was he not a Mesith, which is an enticer, concerning whom the scripture says, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. With Yeshu, however, it was different, for he was connected with the government or royalty. So this is a lot more specific, even calling Yeshu the Nazarene. That's, that's obviously Jesus. I mean, either, you have to really just ignore the fact in front of you like to read that just that line alone on the eve of passover yeshu the nazarene that's talking about jesus <laughs> you know and you could see why they stripped that out of the censored version because there's no way to argue that that's not jesus and then moving further down where it said all the way at the bottom where it said with yeshu however it was different for he was connected with the government or royalty that's talking about the bloodline of David because of the prophecy in the Old Testament that the Messiah would come from the royal bloodline of David. And that's why they ripped that whole thing out. Because now, okay, you, you cannot say that this is some random name, Ben Estadia, who, whoever that guy was, that, that, that this Sanhedrin 43a is talking about him. And that's why that censored version has been passed around. But like I said, it's just, you know, all these people who are, you know, naysayers about it, like, God, just, just Google, bro. Google this. This this is a this is an archaeological fact. This is what that manuscript says, not the prior one that I read that is very popular and being passed around. That 
that is the Sanhedrin council talking of Jesus. Like he is a historical figure. Like there, you have to literally look at this and deny what you are reading in front of your eyes and just say, up, oh, he wasn't real guys. You know, <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, he's, not, he's not real, you know, like <laughs> And I think that's why some people do it, because the more you look into it, the more you start to see, like, there's just no way to explain this stuff away other than saying it's all made up. It's just it's all a fantasy, boys and girls. Like, it's just it's all it's all it's all fake. You know, that's that's the only way that you could argue against it, you know. And then if you were to and I'm sorry, I know I always go on my tangents here. I apologize. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make this one a fast one. Even if you were to acknowledge it, like let's say, uh, like if you were to acknowledge this and say, "Oh, it's real," oh, but the but the church made it. Well, how can they have made it prior to the church existing? Because the Talmud covers the entirety of the Sanhedrin and Pharisee and Jewish history, and they were writing it as they went. <laughs> so you know, you can't you can't just say it's fake. You can't just say, "Oh, it's not real," but. I, I digress. I apologize. <laughs> no, you, you hit on an amazing point that people seem to really dig into the minutia of it. Christ has to be named as either Christ or Jesus. And if it's not mentioned as such, it can't be the same person. It can't be Christus. It can't be the wise king. It can't be uh, the savior of mankind. It can't be any kind of description. It has to be the name. But if I was to talk about, say, someone from my timeline now, as being an orange man with a clipped ear. Who am I talking <laughs> about? Clearly it's Trump. I don't have to call him Trump. I can describe him in many different ways. And we see that in history. People who didn't yes. know of Christ by certain names referred to him as other things. Um, yeah. Here's a great one from Suetonius um, from 69 to 140 AD. Suetonius was a Roman historian uh, of the imperial house under Emperor Hadrian. His writings about Christians describe their treatment under the Emperor Claudius, 41 to 54 AD. Because the Jews at Rome caused constant disturbances at the instigation of Christus, Christ, he, Claudius, expelled them from the city of Rome. This expulsion took place in 49 AD, and in, and in another work, Suetonius wrote about the fire which destroyed Rome in 64 AD under the reign of Nero. Nero blamed the Christians for the fire, and he punished Christians severely as a result. Nero inflicted punishment on the Christians, a sect given a new and mischievous religious belief, Christus. We've got accounts of people being expelled because they followed Christ. He's just being called Christus. It's a variation of the name, but it's the same guy. It's another account. Probably not going to like this one because it's a Roman account, but it's still another area to triangulate your data sets from. And even even Christos means anointed one, so Christians are one crowned one, anointed one, right? So it 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 <laughs> like I was doing a etymology breakdown, and it was sin used to be the moon god for a Turkish moon god, and this is the root word for Allah. And cathode, cathedral, also has a connection etymology to moon. But in the Greek for us, sin means what? To miss the mark. And again, I laugh at the irony because Astaroth, deified Semiramis, Nimrod's wife, she's the queen of the heavens, moon worship. So you're already seeing a similarity. Like it, you might be saying one particular word, but what would sin technically mean? It was just like, well, you're degrading, you're horrible. It's just no. You're missing something of the way that you're supposed to be going. You're not staying focused and full throttle and following the word and abiding by it. You're starting to lean off and go onto your own understandings. That is ultimately what that is. But it's like, I think modern Christianity, if you ask the average person, what's paganism? It's like, well, it's worshiping Satan. Yes, but what are the practices? What are the, the things to see there? What are the elements? Let's break that down. What was worship to Grove and Ashtaroth to Baal? What did that actually look like? And when you start bringing this stuff up, folks, they don't even know what it was. They don't even know what it is. And we're doing a lot of that today. So when people are starting suddenly coming along and starting to distort what Christ was and what he stood for, and in opposite to that, it's like, well, you literally can prove that Christ existed because everything that a lot of denominations, particularly one particular church, stands for, it can literally be debunked time and time again with scripture. And you literally, that's what scripture is there for. Compare, contrast. Does this hold up to what was taught? No. And I think that's the biggest thing is that the real Christian is the fifth gospel. 
You have Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Christian, but most folks aren't reading the first four. The Christian is supposed to be representation of the anointed one, celestial ambassadors, the bridesmaid, still holding the light, the torch, and lamp uh, to show to the world that this is what true Christianity is. At, in the very least, that people who are cynical of denominations and religion, that we're an anomaly enough to them to say, well, there's something different about you, the hope and faith that's within you. I think, honestly, somebody like Archaics and other folks like this, they are putting such cynicism and second thoughts of doubt, which is exactly what the serpent did in the Garden of Eden. So for me, I'm seeing it come full circle. It's like, did he really say that? Is that really what his word means? And that's and, and a common theme, man. Oh, go ahead. Yes. You go for it like a guy. Uh, it, this will be a fast one. This is, this is not a tangent. But that's that's the common theme is like trying to sow the seeds of doubt. And that's why it's so important to just to read the Bible, to read it. Yes. You have to read it. And people need to understand, don't even listen to us. Go and look for the information yourself. You know, that's like, that's always the the cliff note for everything I feel like we've talked about. Because I've heard on your podcast many a times, both you guys, I, you know, I say it a lot of mine, like, don't take our word for it. Just just go and read it, man. But you, you have to have the motivation to seek this stuff out yourself. Because if you don't, you're going to rely on fast answers, boom, boom, quick, guys who are just saying random things, you know, like Jesus wasn't real. The Bible was made up at the Council of Nicaea, which which is also not historically correct. That that mm -hmm. that whole thing started from a movie from Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. Like, the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to reel myself back in, Drew. No, <laughs> no, I, I can I can in. tap I can tap onto this. You keep going. <laughs> so, so, like, just on a quick sidebar note, right? The entire biblical canon was pretty much canonized like 400 years before the Council of Nicaea happened, right? Uh, it was called the Moratorian Fragment. So out of 27 books of the New Testament, 27, I think 21, 21 were already canonized within the first century, within the first century, right? And Christ was crucified in the first century. Within the first century, 26, I'm sorry, 21 of the 27 books were already canonized. The the uh, Council of Nicaea had to do with the doctrine of Arianism, which was saying that Christ was not wholly divine, right? And they were there to establish that no, he is both. He is holy God. He is holy divine man and God in the flesh. Had nothing to do with the canonization. All books were canonized in the Council of Hippo, like two two hundred years before. Nicaea happened but again like you don't know that if you're just listening to all the mainstream esoteric anti-christians screaming at you know into their microphone that oh it was the council of Nicaea that made the bible that compiled the new testament and that invented Jesus' name which or and I'm not even going to get into that that's also another a five minute google search it will t will show you that no they did not invent his name it's it's a translational thing from uh, Hebrew to Greek to Latin to English, and how and how phonetics work. So, but I, anyway, I digress. I just what, want to are slide you, that are you telling there. me Tom Hanks <laughs> lied to me, Luca? Are you saying Tom Hanks lied? One hundred percent, dude. Like, uh, it's it's bad. But that's the thing, man. It's like you know, it's it's a cultural thing. You know, it's mainstream. People hear it and they just they assume it's true. You yeah, know, if, if, the, I, if the if the broader culture is talking about it, it must be true, right? Why would I need to go mm -hmm. look into this myself? And like Indeed. you mentioned, we share information that we found on, through our own discernment, our own research, but it's up to you to go and look at it for yourself and then form your own conclusion. This is just mm -hmm. where we're coming from, from our basis and our research. We're not here to tell you what is true and what is not true. That is up to you to do so. And this is where I think archaics really falls on the sword of attacking the catholic church for their misdoings which i wholly agree on um there's one person he references in this video asubius which was an early church father who wrote a text called how it may be lawful and fitting to use a falsehood as a medicine and for the benefit of those who want to be deceived. He uses this as somewhat of a lichpin to show that Christ was completely made up and a means to control European nations. That's not what that is. 
that's evidence that the church has used elements to control people. It doesn't necessarily go straight to the idea that Christ is completely made up. It definitely backs up the idea that the Catholic Church has a lot to answer for in the way in which they've controlled nation states across Europe since its inception. Absolutely, that's a great piece of evidence. But he's really clutching at straws trying to make that connection there that Christ is completely made up. And like you mentioned, there's that translational version of names. My name is Andrew. If I'm going to go back to Latin, it's Andreas. It sounds similar etymologically. It slightly subtly changes with letter phonetic changes from language to language. After all, Christian is a Germanic language. How do we? How else are we going to take a a Semitic language, apply it to Greek, apply it to Latin, and then apply it to to a Germanic text? There's going to be subtle changes in that. And by thinking it has to be exactly the same, isn't proof. It's not proof. It's it's clutching at straws and really adamantly trying to make something true that is absolutely not. I think um, I that's part of the thing that folks aren't adding is that you have to understand Babel is a factor here, but like all the languages were confused. But then what do we get in the day of Pentecost? Everyone was hearing the gospel in their own native tongue. And why? Because that is the gift of discernment of the Holy Spirit being laid out on the people. It's not like, you know, humble, love, love, love. no. <laughs> But if you truly were seeking and you might have heard something in, in, in your version of your language, but then God wanted you to hear it. Why? Because all of a sudden this is going to start stampeding. But the message gets out regardless of the different different tongues being spoken with it. And that is the significance, folks, is that like you could say Senior Jesus, but we still know you mean Lord <laughs> Christ Jesus. You know what I'm saying? It's not because I, I was reading something and the, the, the missionary was saying that he had to break it down, or he was hearing the, the translator say that it was in Senior mm -hmm. Jesus. He's like, look at him, I'm like, what do you mean, dude? He's like, well, you see, in the etymology down here, you have to refer I don't to know this. Why that was so <laughs> funny. <laughs> It, you know, it, it's it, it's funny, but at the same time, we have to understand. Mm. But is everybody still hearing the gospel in their own tongue before the end times? Yes. It's because at the end of the day, we're all speaking a bastardized language of Babylon, where the re our etymology comes from a little German, a little bit of French, and then we get this because of the Angelus. You know, whatever <laughs> origins of how this word got all over the place, are we still believing in the one at the end of the day? That is my takeaway. I don't really care so much about the name because as Drew just brought out, like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to be different. If you go somewhere else over uh, overseas, I'm pretty sure my name is meaning something probably absolutely horrible, but... <laughs> It's, it's, it's that's not the takeaway the takeaway is what do you do you believe in what the person said and what the word is i'm trying to go back through some of his arguments now for the existence of christ not being there and brandon one came up in his presentation towards the end that i thought would be amazing for you because you've done the breakdowns on previous cultures prior to say the hebrews and the israelites um right, so right say the Assyrians and everyone in that kind of area. His argument for Christ not existing is the archetype of Christ existing prior to his to his birth. Say the Egyptians, the uh the Babylonians, the Sumerians, they all have that archetype. And you've got one of the best answers to this. Why does the archetype of Christ, a Messiah, appear before the existence of Christ? Right. Well, again, speculation and theory, but basing off of research. Um, but a lot of that I would suspect is that the fallen angels, they see God create everything. They can't create, but that's one of the significances of why it's God's word was made flesh. That's significant because they cannot create. They can mirror, they can replicate, they can duplicate, but they cannot create. That is the significance there. So they're seeing all of this go down and then they're understanding that he's got He's got something down the line, but they don't quite understand who this individual is going to be, how he's going to get here. And so they're over here trying to say, OK, Nimrod, we're going to try to explain the best we can. It's going to be like a rebirth ceremony. Um, there's going to be like a baptismal thing, too. And it's and these are all elements that later on that Christ is doing, but he's doing it for the real reasons. But the angels, again, what do they do? They're always staring in awe. I wonder what's God doing? What is that going to mean? I don't know. Let's try this. And you get the story of Mithraism, which is a lot of what Tammuz is. And honestly, I was laughing at one thing. They had another story with Attis, who you know this is Tammuz because it two versions of him. He was either castrated or he um, died by a wild boar. And this is why the Catholics do 40 days of Lent and they eat pork for 40 days. They're just going, okay. 
But with Addis, their lore said that he died. That was like the end until at some point he'll come back. Then they started adapting the text going, whoa, okay, so we can change it because he can be resurrected. And then we'll just, and they edit it after the time of Christ. So I'm I'm chuckling in the sense that this has already been being laid out because for them, their Messiah figure is supposed to be Tammuz reborn for the third time or Nimrod. And that's honestly what the the gene, uh, the Euroboros symbol, the infinity logo you guys might know it best as. That's what that's supposed to represent is Nimrod regenerated. You get Tammuz and then it's supposed to get Tammuz going back into Nimrod. So we hear a lot of uh, preachers saying that's supposed to be Nimrod coming back in the last days as the archetype of Antichrist. What I found out is a particular guy that's running this fall, <laughs> Orange Man happens to have etymology that goes directly back to Tammuz, and I've traced it all the way back to Baal. And I'm chuckling because then we get somebody like um, Baron, who if you're going by their other predictive novels before they were doing movies, the last president of the United States. And when we went over into the Middle East, we were, the first things that we hit after 9-11 were mausoleums and museums, and we dug up two individuals. And one of them had a fish in his chest tummy region, which, ironically enough, Baron happened to be born in the month of Pisces. So for me, I'm over here going, guys, when you understand what Antichrist is or what a substitute, that's what the root word would be coming down to, is something in place of or you put before, you start going, okay, so the idea of their God is not a celestial being coming down to save you. It's one coming up from the abyss, the serpent god, as they're believing in, and and eliminates all of their enemies and threats. This is kind of why we're reading about world. How come you're not getting rid of the Roman oppression? How come you're not getting... Why? Because this is what they were expecting in their deity. And Christ was not what they were wanting. So when they put him on the cross, that was representation of the Kabbalah tree. The cross is a symbol of Tammuz. And when you fold it up, that represents Earth. That's going to a Kabbalah cube. When you roll the dice, that connects into theosophy. So I was over here going, this is very interesting that they then put him on a cross, which at the very top is known as Kether, translated into Masonic Latin. It is known as Corona. And we're now living in an age <laughs> where people are looking to this chakra that you could lay right on top or the Caduceus staff you could lay right on top with the Sephiroth. And this is exact parallel of Antichrist, a symbol that Christ died upon, is now the symbol that people are always saying, well, we're doing it for Christ. It's like, if you knew what that symbol meant, you wouldn't be having any symbols in your life. Sorry for the tangent ramp, but I'm just trying to connect a lot of elements always. At that's no, no, good. That, that, that's great, because essentially what it comes down to, and I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, Archaics does come from a, a system of belief that he thinks uh, the deceiver is real. Lucifer, the devil, whatever one name you want to give this guy, he is real and he wants to wipe us out. He wants to destroy God's creation. He comes from that position and he gives us all these types of evidence or data sets that we're being deceived. And his, one of his major linchpins is the archetype of Christ is just a copy of all these other people that have existed throughout time. Well, yes. if you were a deceiver and you knew what God's plan roughly was, you got the cliff notes of what God wants to achieve, wouldn't you see that and try to sow doubt, division, and deceive mankind by repeating that before it actually occurs? Because then it gives all kinds of doubt to when he does arrive. People in Jesus' time probably went, oh, no, nah, this isn't right. Remember Ra, the god Ra in Egypt over there? He had a similar kind of creation. Why would we believe this guy? He's just some guy trying to take all our stuff. Mm -hmm. What, um, so I didn't get that far into his, uh, like, live stream because for reasons that we had discussed uh, prior to us going live, when he refers to like the archetype of Christ, like what specifically? Because is he talking about like just the amalgamation of the personality throughout the history? Because some of these old like pagan uh, stories I've read that are supposed to be parallels are pretty are kind of a reach, you know. Like for instance, the big one has always been right, uh, Zoroasterism. So there was this book, I don't remember the title, but they, a lot, you might hear some folks say that, well, in Zoroasterism, right, there was a virgin that gave birth to Mithra. Well, if you read the actual, so it's called the, um, oh, 
the far god i think that's the terminology used for like the uh collection of writings for uh zoroasterism that is not mentioned in any of those mithra was actually one of the lesser gods because they believed in a pantheon of gods right So Mithra was a lesser god. He was the god of open plains, and he was actually born from a rock under a sacred tree. There's actually nothing in there that talks about any type of virgin birth. The reason I bring that up, too, is because, you know, some of these parallels are really, like, lax. Well, Jesus said, love your neighbor, and Mithra said, love your neighbor. You know, so, so dumb things like that. Like, that, that's like, that's like a generality It's like the same thing when people say like the Bible copied some of these uh, pagan stories like uh, like the Epic of Gilgamesh. Well, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, it says that the sky is blue and the Bible also says the sky is blue. So the Bible, co um, yeah, no, I mean, seriously, you know, like what they all have in common is, yeah, they talk about a worldwide flood. So what, what, what can we all get from that? That there was there was a worldwide flood. But what stands out with like, let's say the Bible is how specific it gets the length of time, where things are, where they went, who who was there, the reason it happened are all very specific. And that's why I asked that question because I don't recall, and I've read, uh, Brandon definitely knows better than me, especially in the esoteric field, but a lot of like the esoteric readings and writings I have read, I really don't see anybody who mimics Christ wholly So aside from the one-off, you know, so i i have a i have a place that i would blame for this and it becomes back to popular culture zeitgeist remember when that kind of that documentary popped up i did the watch stand? that yes it made a lot of great connections with pagan um belief systems and that archetype being used but it did make some flat out lies uh, particularly did, around yeah. the virgin birth um the 12 apostles of three wise men, the three magi, the three um, Muhammadians. It gives all these different connections. And some of them weren't actually factual at all. They just mm -hmm. applied that onto other ancient cultures. Sometimes singular accounts do exist. The son of a God. Well, there were pantheons of gods who had sex with each other and had children. Of course, mm -hmm. there's going to be a son of a God. Um, mm -hmm. He was died and resurrected. Well, we see that in multiple God stories where because they're by very definition, otherworldly, they have the power to come back. Doesn't necessarily mean it's a story of Christ. There's mm. elements that are very similar. They rhyme, but they're not the same. Yes. Of course. Well, and and that's... Oh, go ahead, Brandon. No, I was just going to give a little explanation for that. Do so you ever watch the movie Venom? No. With uh, Sony or whatever? So are you at least familiar with the plot with Spider-Man? Yeah. The oh, yeah. Character? yeah. Okay, so that's kind of how these people are ver picturing it. But instead of God, we have Ra, Ray, Nimrod. So when he dies, he becomes Osiris, god of the underworld. But reincarnated, he comes back into Tammuz. You get mm -hmm. this whole Babel mythos. And again, you're getting traveling, you're getting migrating. People's tongues are getting confused. People are trying to say, well, in comparison, it'd be like this tree. All right, so we want to worship this tree. There's always that element at play. But these people believe in a, like a very Venom-esque ideology is like all these slain titans like Gary Wayne digs into mm -hmm. We are possessed with them. They have now filled us with their spirits. So when we get into Hollywood and stars, and you see the Hollywood Walk of Fame, it's all pentagrams. These people, as opposed to Christianity, they believe the same lie in the Garden of Eden, that you will ascend to become like gods, which is to mm -hmm. be on the belt of Orion, where the stars of the gods are. This is ascending to a pantheon um, existence. And angels in Hebrew lore were known as star walkers. So this is kind of how they're, again, so you're getting mm -hmm. a very butchered version. And by the time you get to sure. Christ, what's significant? You're son of creator God, not the sons of God that came down and had affairs of daughters of men, like in Enoch 6 and Genesis 6, 4. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it's, you're the, you're the son of creator God. Yeah. Well, what are you doing here? It's not for you to talk about right now. It's not for you to other people to hear. <laughs> Go into that herd of pigs. But I find that very significant <laughs> because what do demons want? Slaying giants. I want a body. I want to have that fleshly existence again. So we already see that the, the, whether these gods, giants, heroes of men, men of renown, whether they get it any means possible, whether it's through AI, whether it's um, an autonomous machine, mm. whether it's actually human demonic possession, that is ultimately what they are wanting in exchange. But what these people don't realize, it's literally a pyramid scheme, you know, the all-seeing eye thing, <laughs> that I can ascend to become like my own god. I just need to look within and become my own. It's egotism. 
uh, very yes. similar to the truth yep. of Scientology with that fate inability that it's already a little God in me. And I just need to achieve and reach for the stars to become that. Mm-hmm. If, if that gives a little bit more uh, clarity and context, what you're speculating there. Yeah, no, it does. And I appreciate it. And that's that, yeah. you know, that's always kind of been the theme for uh, from what I've seen for like the esoteric writings and the occult writings is 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 the egotism and the, yeah. the arrogance, the flat out arrogance, um, especially like if you've when you read um, the Kabbalah, like, holy smokes. I mean, some of the some of the writings in there are just absolutely outrageous. There's one in specific that I always recall that it says that where it says that God is not realized without us. God needs us. That to me is just so like that type of thinking to me is just so wildly outrageous to basically in so many words, make God into a slave of man like that. I, it's just, it's craziness. It's crazy. You know, to think that you are above God or you have more knowledge than God or know better than God knows like the, the literal creator of everything is just, you Jeez, gotta humble yourself. They're it takes one a step, real. They're one step away from being the Vulcans of Star Trek, where they killed their god because they're mm. more trouble than what they were worth. That's literally what it sounds yeah. like. No, no, it, it, we don't need God. He needs us. He yeah, needs that's, us. Then right. that's basically right. what it is, right? Is ba- they're basically the writings talk about, and this is obviously for people who have not read it yet. I, this is the watered down version but it's basically saying that God is self-actualized through us because we, you know, we have our, we are our own gods, like Brandon is saying. And that, that is the, that is the crux of all the esoteric writings and the belief system is that we are, we are our own gods trying to uh, escape this human form, which doesn't eat to me personally, doesn't make sense. Cause okay. Uh, well, who, who, who really imprisoned us? You know, they kind of talk about, I've heard the low energy argument the I've heard, you know, uh, what was a uh, i can't remember the name of the deity in like um in in the hindu religion you know soul harvest like so many crazy reasons that just don't make sense well what what type of god are you then if you are being subjugated by these outside forces you know what i mean like so i it just it's it's an ego thing like like we've said man and it it just it really takes a humble person to just accept that you know you're going to be wrong at time nobody is perfect you're going to be wrong you're going to make mistakes. I've made many mistakes. I've been wrong many a times. It's okay. Just admit it, move on and fix it. That's it. It takes a very humble person to come under the wing of Jesus for his protection and just for his guidance and wisdom. And that's really all God wants for you. Real, Really, I mean, is for you to live the best version of you, right? And to be humble, and to just abide by his teachings. Like he's really not asking for a lot. Like when you, when you really break it down, you know, live a proper holy life because he is our God. He is holy. So we must be holy, you know, live your life, but don't, don't, you know, hurt people. Don't hurt yourself, reprove and rebuke and, you know, to speak in truth. And that's really it. I mean, he's not, he's really not asking for much, you know, but people kind of multiply the baggage that's not really there you know what i mean like he god he's not really asking much of us other than to preach and to just be decent human beings in accordance with his will and his his law you know so yeah there was um a book i was reading is about the impeachment of andrew johnson and there was a phrase that he stated and i did the history search goes back to fox populi um it was a wake track written in 1709 and the title of the phrase, it was written in Latin, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Mm. And I read that in the book and I was going, wait, what did you... I reread it and read it again? I said, I don't like that. I don't like that <laughs> at all. Because he was referring in a voting sense that the voice of the people yeah. is the voice of God. So they're, whatever they tell me to do, it was what God wanted. And I'm over here going, excuse me, when's the last time a vast majority of humans knew what god wanted we don't know the mind of god to say that you know the mind of god is absolute blasphemy to say that you are the voice of god oh brother we're about to hit a whole theology argument of are you serious right now that anything you say is god brandon Uh you you clearly haven't seen the new advertisement by trump where he says god told you all to vote republican he wants me i'm the guy put me in the in the chair i'll be the president that's essentially a vote against trump is a vote against god i was like 
What? Well, it's a, um, this is a bit of a side tangent, but that's essentially what's been coming out of the, the Trump yes. camp since the assassination. Oh, God intervened. God saved me. He smoked nice. the guy behind me, but he saved Trump. So you have to vote Trump. <laughs> that's a slippery slope. To I should have I'm sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> it's, it's a slippery slope, man. Idolizing people like that. I think I personally think yes. that is that's wrong. Like whatever first your Samuel political a, the first Samuel 8 gives a clear indication that I don't like king, kings of over my men especially my people mm -hmm. don't be like other countries and it says they didn't reject you Samuel they rejected me <laughs> so that's my biggest thing folks is like that's also another aspect of what this thing does is what that implants in people's minds is you start trusting government over God or you start looking to a politician a celebrity as that substitute a fill in before God and with everybody being, oh, you're anti this, you're anti that, you're anti. Isn't it not easy to emerge as anti Christ? Because everybody's mm. arguing the semantics over their paranoia of this. If this is true, if that's true, blah, blah, blah. it's like it is true. The thing is, you are not slowing down your mind and it's humbling your heart to acknowledge that there is a God. And this is what it says a man will be lovers of themselves. Egotism mm -hmm. is being amped up in our culture every day, whether people don't realize it or not. You are a lot of people are already first degree um, Masons. They just don't. They don't realize it because they're like, well, yeah, sovereign being. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh -uh. no, <laughs> sovereign being. Let's put a definitive name on that. He's got a few, but let's put a definitive name of who are you referring to? Because you can't just do plus one fill in blank. No, you have to be specific, and that's what they want is vagueness. Because if you acknowledge Christ, you're acknowledging the word was the fulfillment was made. Believing in Christ is believing in pro past promises that were made and future ones that are already made to us if we actually live for him. A lot of Christians don't seem to grasp that. Now, I've got to pose another argument from Archaics on this. Um, and you gentlemen are far more well-versed in scripture than I am. I'm a toddler who's still learning to walk when you guys are running. Archaics came at it from a position that, according to him, there's no scriptural account for a second coming of Jesus that there's only one coming and that is yet to occur throughout the entire, supposedly according to, and then this is the way I interpret it. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt in what he said was there is no documentation within the Bible, both old and new Testament for a second coming of Jesus. What's your take on that gentleman? He clearly never read revelations a and B the whole. Well, he specifically first... named revelations as not having it in it really really that's yeah interesting Which i was a bit thrown by because that's the one yeah. i've read quite a bit yeah that's 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 just that's not true did he did he actually give reasons why he felt that way or did he just no say, oh, it's not this is there. the interesting thing i found and this is just a critique of the way he presented his information he did give the benefit of the doubt later on saying i got all my information from these texts it's up to you guys look at them but at the same time, he made pretty large statements like there's no second coming of Jesus in Revelation, but then actually refused to cite anywhere where there might be, say, a misconception that could make people think it says there's a second coming. He doesn't actually analyze it or address it, but there are aspects of you know, scripture, precise verses that say there is a second coming. Mm -hmm. There is. And the first, the first arrival was him being born. You know, that fulfilled Jewish Old Testament prophecy of the messiah so his his second coming is that that that's literally what revelation is about it's a, it's about him in the future coming back with the saints us right those who die in christ proclaiming the name of the lord to uh separate the righteous from the wicked to wage war against the devil and his his fallen angels and i mean it's it's literally the entire book of revelations I honestly don't even know how to answer that because that's just so, like that goes back to what we were saying, like uh, with the uh, Babylonian Talmud with the Sanhedrin page. You just have to look at it and say, nah, this isn't real. <laughs> <laughs> like that's basically like, how do you even art? Like it's it like, how do you even argue against somebody who just doesn't want to believe? And that's really what it comes down to. Like, how can you read revelations where it, literally says i jesus have sent my angels to testify to you about these things for the churches and listening to the word of god to from what jesus is saying and what his the description is of him literally coming back to the world and then you're just like nah this is not this is not what it says <laughs> okay okay i mean yeah. 
It's almost like, a, his, it, his mind's already made up and that's fine. But I would expect someone of his following um, and his wealth of knowledge, which arguably he does have with a lot of the texts he reads, would be able to back it up with specific citations of why it's mentioned and why it's wrong. But he didn't provide you know, that. It goes to, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, Brandon, if you have something. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. To say. This is a little, this is parallels what what he is saying, right? There was an there was somebody making this argument that you don't know, let's say like uh, the book, uh, Moses wrote the first five books, right? You don't know what Moses was saying when he wrote those first five books because they were all written during different time periods of his life. I actually heard somebody make that argument and that makes no sense. And you, like, you can't even... I don't even know. I can't even put into words how crazy that sounds. Like you're telling me that the person who wrote the books, because he wrote them at different stages of his life, you can't. You don't know exactly what he was saying. Like, how does that even make sense? Yes, what, how can? What, how could? What about a diary then? A personal diary? Because someone's uh, written a you. diary of different points in their life that doesn't make sense. It makes exactly. sense for the contextual time in which it was written. Exactly. And their but this is the but this is the problem. Like when you hit that level of uh, just just you know, I just believe you're at that level of like you're just flat out denying it. What's in front of your face? It's like if I walk outside with you and I put my hand around you, I'm like, hey, little buddy, the sky's blue, and you look up and you're like, no, it's not. What more discussion is there? That's how I look at stuff like this. It's like, wh like, what more discussion can we possibly have? Like, if you're just flat out denying what's right in front of you, that then it is, I, I can't help you. I'm sorry. Like, there's really no more discussion to be had. And maybe, maybe that's the wrong thing to say, but that's just how I feel. Like, you know, like to even say that there's nothing in Revelations that says that there's a second coming of, of, of Jesus that's 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 going outside and saying the sky's not blue. I'm sorry. I wish I had a better answer for you, buddy. But, like, it, <laughs> no, but it also <laughs> dismisses Theologians 5, 1 through 3. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying there is a peace and a security and then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains came upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. That is the second coming. They're telling you in theologians. It's not just in Revelation. It's mentioned many times. So I was quite taken back by such a broad brush statement that there's no actual second coming mentioned in the New Testament or the Bible in general. I was very, very uh, taken back by that. Yeah, and... Well, even me, this is why I have a real big beef now with communion. Now that I understand the symbolism of what that all means, because a lot of Christians are sitting there and they're going, thank you for dying on the cross for me. And you're such a great guy. And we only read that little thing in Corinthians. But what is the significance? That was a marriage contract. You accept this cup. You're accepting me. I'm handing it now to the bride. Do you accept the father's selection here? Do you accept the father's son? And she could say no. And she could say yes. Again, like Lucas said. Yeah, I want to be part of the family. You want to accept the family name. You want to accept everything that comes with this. Yes. Okay, cool. And what does the young man do? I go to add on to my father's house to induct in the new bride because now you're part of the family. And what did Christ say? I go to prepare a place for you up in my father's house. Okay, significance. This is somebody that means you have to come back for your bride. And hence why the parable of the sleeping bridesmaids is given um, in Matthew. I be Is it 24? I believe. Think Where so. there's also passages there in Matthew 24, 42 and 44 it says, watch ye therefore, and you know the, not the hour your Lord doth come. Be ye ready for uh, in such an hour as ye think not the son of man cometh. Mm -hmm. What is he talking about? He's like, well, sleeping bridesmaids, those of you who are going, you know, oh, everything's fine. Peace and security. Everything's going back to normal. No, You're supposed to be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walketh about for whom he may devour. What does a lion do? They go after those that are kind of straying from the herd, those who are kind of weak, and that's what they prey upon. So if you don't know your word, you're going to be susceptible to these people that are lying. Just a couple other things that people are writing this down in a um, devotional sense as they're listening to us. There's 1 Corinthians 15. Um, that passage you read from 1 Thessalonians was 4.13. 
Um, Acts 3, 19 through 21. Uh, Hebrews 9, 27 through 28. Christ will appear and bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And then again in James 5, 7 through 11, the passage is urging the church to hold together in the face of overwhelming pressures at the end of history approaches. So there is more than enough to indicate that there's going to be a return. But I think what they're trying to weaponize, as we stated before, they are creating Armageddon. Yes, it's not, but they're messing up the timeline so that those who were who were actually digging and seeking the true meaning of the interpretation of things, that they're going to be falling astray because they weren't seeking discernment. Again, that's what the significance of the of the lamps are. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. As we get, I believe it's Psalm 119. So what's discernment? That's the oil that they didn't have. And when they ran back to go to try to understand what that was, it was too late. They knock on the door and says, depart from me. I never knew you. You didn't bother to get to know me. You didn't seek knowledge. So why would you want get out? So I think that's some there's a little element there is that a lot of folks don't seem to realize is in order. It's two things. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit is he gives abundantly to those who seek him. He um, <laughs> I'll have to hand it to Archaics that he he does some some great weasel words in the way he he comes across in his his approach because he openly states that he wants to discourse with anyone and discuss it and he's open for people to challenge his his uh, information his data sets he he encourages it and he welcomes it at the same time he says but I don't want anyone quoting scripture at me because that's your rhetoric. And that tells me you're a brainwashed person who has no critical thinking skills and you're another robot. Well, okay. You go by that logic. That's fine. But then you can't use the argument of there's no second coming in revelation, because if you're using scripture as an argument, you have to expect people are going to use scripture as argument back. So he's already setting the parameters of the argument up to where he's always going to win. Which is so disingenuous, so disingenuous. Guys, not so, blue, bro. So he's, do, he's doing exactly <laughs> what the exactly Catholic what Church did. Is. Like, as when people were starting to read and understand the Bible for themselves, they're like, "No, no, execute, execute," because they would then understand the true interpretation and meaning of things. That's why they wanted us to stay stupid. So the thing that he's bashing is the exact same thing he's doing because he's saying only I can quote the true interpretation of this book. Historically, let's just going historically. The thing that he doesn't like. So let's start there. <laughs> Well, just on a quick, I just want to read this passage. I, I had a look for it. I couldn't remember where in Revelations it was, but I, I found it now. For starters, just so everybody listening, uh, maybe, you know, I don't know where everybody is in their walk or if they're having that walk, but the in the Bible, the living word of God is Jesus, right? The word of God is is referring to Jesus, right? God, God in the flesh. So this is Revelations chapter 19, starting at verse 11. It is titled, The Coming of Christ. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages wars. Multiple times throughout the Bible, it talks of Jesus being the one with the authority because he is God to judge people, right? His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with the robe dipped in, bl dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. It is talking about Jesus. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron." It is, it is talked about multiple times throughout the Bible. Jesus will ascend to the throne here on earth because this is the new Jerusalem here on earth. He is the ruler. He will rule them with a rod of iron. This is Jesus. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all, the birds which fly in mid-heaven, come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assemble to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. This is Jesus coming back. He's like, I just, 
again, it's like sky's not blue, bro. I mean, if you but like, does this come this back to one... the? Does this become down to semantics of it's not explicitly saying Jesus Christ comes on the horse, Jesus Christ? Like, where are these people coming from? Can they not read between the lines? Well, I think that's exactly, you hit the nail the on the head. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, they're just relying on the fact on semantics. Like, it's just easy to look at it and say, "Nah, bro." You know, that's it, you know, and not like, like, come on, you know what I mean? I mean, there, I think it's in, I have to double check. I want to say it's in 11, uh, where it says, I, Jesus, like he is, he names himself when he's given the revelation to John, I, Jesus say these words and it is faithful and true and can be relied. I'm, I'm butchering the whole, the whole scripture there, but, um, I'm going to, I'm going to try to pull it up, but he says, I, Jesus, he, when he is giving the revelation to John, like it, this is about Christ plain and simple like there's there's no way around it other than to just say nah bro and then somebody hits you with that i mean what do you how are you supposed like what what is the argument Same well you thing. can't argue back with scripture though because he already said that's rhetoric so you know, exactly himself into a winning corner sky's not blue bro that I mean <laughs> how do you argue with somebody who says that just all right mm. i'll pray for you my brother yeah and very concerning that at the same time at the end of the he gives this whole great presentation and then tries to the appeal to authority by almost saying, he goes, and word for word, I still consider myself a Christian. I believe Jesus is coming back, but at the same time, he spent two hours saying Jesus wasn't a real historical figure. Doesn't mean he won't come back. We're all connected to source differently. We all have different spiritual journeys. So he's using a lot of these new age terms. Where he, it's almost that appeal to if you're a Christian who's doubting, you know, follow me and we will get there in the end. It's okay. Doesn't matter if you've been deceived by the idea of Christ. He's really laying down the idea that his way is the only way. And mm -hmm. it's really, really, really concerning that there's aspects of his argument, which we, I think we've pulled apart tonight very well that doesn't stand up, doesn't stack up well, doesn't pass the pub test, doesn't pass the logic and reason sense. It doesn't pass the theological or historical record. So am I saying we dismissed all of his arguments? Absolutely not, because he has two hours worth of his, uh, his arguments he puts out or his position he puts forward. But a lot of the linchpins, I think we've thoroughly dismissed in this conversation tonight. What do you guys think? I mean, a lot of the and oh, go ahead, Bryn. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. So a lot of the arguments collapse away on their own, just with the whole. You know, you just have to find out and study. Hey, did the crucifixion happen? Is there enough historical data to say that the crucifixion happened? Yes. Okay, there you go. Like, there's really nothing else to argue. Plus, coupled and and it's the totality of everything, right? Coupled with the fact that. What the Bible advocates for God-fearing men and women to do go against our natural proclivities, right? Now, imagine trying to enforce that hundreds, I'm sorry, not hundreds, excuse me, thousands, thousands of years ago, right? You get what I'm saying? Like, that's not the popular thing to do, but yet people did it. So there was obviously something very powerful that they saw or somebody, you know, who gave them that hope and said, hey, maybe this is the right way to live. Does that make sense how I'm explaining it? Like 2000 years ago out in the middle of the desert, it was, I'm sh it was, you know, it was a free for all, you know, there was no law and order. There was really nobody, there was no institution. There was no government really to, you know, try to control the masses yet people, people wanted to follow this way of life. They wanted to abide by the commandments. They wanted to try to live better lives. But, and, and you have to ask yourself why. I mean, realistically, Christianity shouldn't have even made it this far if it was just all nonsensical, nonsensical fairy tale mumbo jumbo. You know, it, Christ, nobody read the story and said, oh, this guy sounds good. Let's throw him in the Quran. Let's throw him in the Vedas. Let's throw him in the, uh, I forgot what the Buddhist book is called. Um, He's in, he's in, he comes up as one of the incarnations of Buddha. Buddha I can't remember yeah. what their book is called. Yeah, I, I can't. I just I can't remember their religious texts. You know, he's believed to be an avatar of uh, one of the Brahmin. There, that's what it is. Brahmin in the Hindu Vedas. Uh, you know, he is a massive, massively important prophet in Islam. I mean, it's just 
there's just too much. And again, like you would have to make this huge wild claim that all these cultures and all these, uh, different people were in on some grand conspiracy and, and for what ends, because everybody says different things about him, right? They all talk about him, but they all say different things about him. I think for most people, and I, I'm not going to go too far into the weeds with this. I think where most people, re sh uh, the question you have to ask yourself, right? Is unequivocally, do you believe in a God, right? Do you believe in God period? If the answer is yes, then God cannot contradict himself. So it stands to reason that all these holy books could possibly be God inspired because they all say different things about God, you know, and that, that's how I look at it. Mm. So. Yeah, I think that's fair, Luca, is that like there's only one book that when you compare it alongside the religion and the institution, you start breaking it down and going, well, that doesn't seem right at all. It's it, and also break off religion as our definition is like it's a faith. Because it, it's a relationship constantly called ecclesia, mm -hmm. body of Christ. This is significant, folks. Because in contrast, all these other religions, they're all trying to surmise that God is this, God is that, you are God. You know, it, it, there's so many variations and definitions of who and what God is that it never acknowledges the core. Just like with atheism, it's saying, well, we just all come from nothing or from space dust. It's like, well, dust of space, dust of the earth, which one is it? One of the things you have to acknowledge is that you're either telling me you come from nothing, which if you're a mathematician, you're telling me zero is the equivalent of you. So if you are zero, then you are nothing. Whereas in, in Christianity, you have to acknowledge the one. You have to acknowledge the start. Who is the one? That is Christ. That is the word. That is God. What a lot of folks don't want to acknowledge is step one, because if you acknowledge step one, that means you have to submit to step one. And a lot of people don't want to do that. They want to substitute. They want to replace and cross that out and put an X, which, again, if you're going by the occult standards, X, I'll ascend to become my own God, Osiris rising, you know. Um, I think that's ultimately what we've come down to is a lot of people are trying to put, cross out Christ or whatever um, salvation or requirements there is because they consciously aware that in order to follow Christ, you have to submit. And that is something that they do not want to do, whether they verbalize it or not. They just want a microwave philosophy to fill in where they're lacking with their own lives. Yeah. I, I tend to think what my major takeaway from watching that presentation twice is that I wholeheartedly believe he thinks he's doing the right thing. And he, he himself says that the words of Christ are beautiful words that people should live their lives by I'll hardly agree, but ultimately he's throwing the baby out of the bathwater because he's hyper fixated on religion. And you only have to look at the etymology of the word religion, re-legion, re-legioning, rebuilding something that once was. No one on this panel, or I think a broader Christians who are waking up to the word, know that the institution of the church has manipulated mankind for a very long time now. That was the re-legioning of something that existed prior to the Christian church. It was weaponized against us. It was used to control us because, you know, God had was on earth. He presented himself to us. We know what it's all about now. We know the end goal of the spiritual war. We know the path we have to walk on. And to throw the baby out of the bathwater because an institution has come and hijacked that, you're selling yourself short and you're missing a lot of information that's very important. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, I think that's a good spot to leave it. We could keep banging on about this, but... I think we would only just devolve into aspects of uh, nitpicking when the case that we've presented tonight, I think is, is pretty strong for the listeners. You know, I do encourage you to go out and listen to his presentation. Um, take it for what it is. It's a different opinion. It's a different take on things, but use your own discernment, use your own logic, your own reason, your own history of research, your own path to discern what's true and what rings true to you in, in the word. And on that note, We'll catch you next time. Oh, I forgot to close this one out of the prayer. My goodness, that's terrible. <laughs> Luca, can you close this out of the prayer, my friend? Oh, sure. <laughs> Heavenly Father, um, I pray that you just uh, open up the eyes and the ears for listeners out there who are uh, searching for, for the truth, searching for Christ. Lord, please just continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom and knowledge to speak in truth and to speak in accordance with your will. In your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Jeez. 
sorry, uh, old fella upstairs. That was a, a boo-boo on my <laughs> behalf. But uh, there we go. That was a good conversation, gentlemen, and we'll have to do it again. Catch you all next time. Thank you. All right.